Um, but the biggest problem with it is that it fails to mention the actual thing this talk is about, which is persona, in particular, the strange necessity of inventing a persona in, in personal narrative. If you don't write personal narrative, you should. <laughs> Patricia Hempel says, fail to write your life and you have no life. <laughs> But e even if you don't, I think some of the things that I'm going to say will make you a cannier reader of, of nonfiction narrative, the essay or the memoir or even first-person journalism. If you've never written it, you probably think that persona is a no-brainer and that the word invention is a bit suspect. suspect. The narrator of a memoir or an essay or even of journalism in the first person is, after all, the author of that work. To use a jargony adjective, he or she is, quote, unsurrogated. That word unsurrogated is meant to distinguish the speaker of a work of nonfiction from the narrator of a story or a poem. The narrator of a story or a poem is usually a character that the author has invented out of whole cloth. The author stands behind that speaker like a master puppeteer manipulating the strings. At least that's how I imagine it. I don't write poetry or fiction. In personal narrative, the author also stands behind the narrator, manipulating the spirit strings. But in this case, the puppet looks a lot like the puppeteer, only a little bit better. Over the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to offer up some of my thoughts on persona. Before I do, though, I, I want to say, in case I forget later and make it sound as riveting as watching a mechanic do a brake job, that the crafting of persona is a deeply, deeply mysterious process. It usually happens unconsciously, and any post-hoc analysis of it is, is probably deeply flawed at best. <laughs> At the most basic level, the persona of a poem, story, or essay is the speaker of that work. The persona is always, regardless of genre, imagined into being. It's always a work of the imagination, even in nonfiction. It is always a made thing. Again, the only thing that varies from genre to genre is the material from which this persona is made. If I'm inventing a persona for the narrator of a story, I have an infinite number of choices. I can make her a ninth century Japanese courtesan or Henry VIII or a vampire or a rabbit. I can dress her in anything I want to dress her in. At least this is how a nonfiction writer imagines fiction. You can correct me later. Um, <laughs> the universe is my closet. In some cases, it seems to me, the more inventive my fictive personae the less inventive might be my personal self-presentation. And um, I have some evidence to back up this theory. I hit center display. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's John in uh, 2009. That's John in 2010. <laughs> Same black t-shirt. There's John, black, another black shirt in 2011, same glasses. Yeah. If, uh, if I'm inventing a persona for an essay or memoir, on the other hand, my choices are much narrower. I can dress my persona <laughs> only. <laughs> yeah, that, does, that, that transition didn't work, did it? No. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't imagine the slides. I can dress my persona in things that are only in my closet. I like that formal problem a lot. It's the thing that draws me to this genre. I, look, Eliot has this phrase, the tyranny of too many possibilities, and Kierkegaard's the infinity of despair. I like a nice, bounded, formal problem. I like being creative with material that is already, to a great degree, given to me. Because the range on offer to me in my writing is narrower. <laughs> That's what I meant to say, John, sorry. I might wish to express a greater range of personae in my real life through my clothing and hairstyles. Let's see. There's, oops, how do I do this? I probably, That's me in 2004. God, I was young <laughs> and thin. 
here's me in 2011, and here's, you know, here's me now. <laughs> so I change, but the writing, the persona, not so much. Um, I put this quote on the board. metaphor is shamelessly stolen from E.B. White in a really wonderful essay called The Essayist. On the essay, the essayist and the essay, forget that, and or on. The essayist arises in the morning and if he has work to do, selects his garb from an unusually extensive wardrobe, but again, not as extensive as that of the fiction writer or poet. He can pull on any sort of shirt, be any sort of person according to his mood or his subject matter. You can read the rest of that. The persona, to say it again, of a personal essay, of any personal narrative, is an elaborately constructed costume that's meant to look as if it was the first thing that your hands touched when you got out of bed in the morning. It is always, always a paradox, an invented thing made up of real parts. Its purpose, less to reveal the writer's true self than to be a construction of that self's reality. It is the camouflage that the writer needs in order to do the work of the essay or memoir, and that work nearly always consists, as Philip Lopate has observed, of dropping past one's psychic defenses. So there's the, the paradox. You, you put on camouflage in order to, to drop your psychic defenses, to become more, more naked. A successful persona is one that performs authenticity. Just as a side note, it, it, and not something I'm going to spend much time on, it, it seems worth noting, though, that the fir in first-person writing, there's almost always more than one persona. In a memoir, there's usually the adult writer looking back fondly, nostalgically, <coughs> critically, incredulously, longingly <laughs> at a younger, more naive version of him or herself. Peter Balakian's memoir, Black Dog of Fate, puts in place, puts into play two, two, memo, two, two personae, the young Peter and, the, and Peter the memoirist. The essay also often puts two or more voices into play. This is the, the essayist talking against him or herself. Ambivalence, of course, being the essayist's natural state of mind. Why does it matter? I've gone. I'm just, I'm not going to apologize. <laughs> <laughs> but I always, I'm relying on other experts. Whatever. This is Vivian Gornick. Personas in the situation and the story. Maybe the most useful book about writing personal narrative that exists. The persona, persona's tone of voice, its angle of vision, the rhythm of its sentences, what it selects to observe and what to ignore are chosen to serve the subject. Yet at the same time, and this is the part that really matters, the narrator or the persona, yet at the same time, the way the narrator or the persona sees things is to the largest degree the thing being seen. The way you see is the thing itself. Persona is not merely the bearer of memory, or of meaning, but the instrument that the writer creates in order to seek or retrieve memory or meaning. It's always there. It's, 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 it's there at the, at the beginning of a piece. It's never an afterthought, though it may change, of course, a great deal in, <clears throat> in revision, which is something that um, we'll talk about in a little bit. So how to go about fashioning a persona? from the materials of your own agitated, anxious, neurotic, self-interested, and boring self. <laughs> it's a live problem for me. Every time I face the blank page, I have no rules for you. I have only a list of things that I remind myself of over and over again to varying degrees and at varying stages in my work. There's a lot of overlap between these things. And also, I realized after I'd written them that they really come down to just three words that my mother would approve of a great deal. Mind your manners. <laughs> the first one is introduce yourself. The most common problem, especially for young writers, especially for young writers who are the beloved darlings of their parents, 
is that they naturally assume that the reader too already knows and loves them. <laughs> they think that because they know who I is, sort of, that you also know who I is. Trace here's Tracy Kidder. The first person beguiles some readers, and the act of writing I tends to make them forget that they have to do more than merely assert the interestingness of their experience. They must, in short, turn themselves into characters, rounded characters, on the page. Here's Philip Lopate near the beginning of an essay titled On the Necessity of Turning Oneself into a Character. And this is one of the reasons I was so foolish to propose giving this talk. I discovered this essay after, after I said, I thought, I'll talk about persona, but he did it really well. And you can download that essay from the internet on the necessity of turning oneself into a character. He doesn't say it, but in personal writing. The problem with I, this is Lopate, is not that it is in bad taste, but that fledgling personal essayists may think they've said or conveyed more than they actually have with that one syllable. In their minds, that I is swarming with background and a lush, sticky past and an almost too fatal specificity. Whereas the reader, encountering it for the first time in a new piece, sees only a slender telephone pole standing in the sentence, trying to catch a few signals to send on. And I, I won't go through all the samples that I've given you, but I, I've offered you three samples of student writing from long before I came to teach at Colgate. So those of you, those of my students in the audience need not worry. <laughs> Any of these are, are you. And you, you, you know, there, there are all sorts of problems here. These are the beginnings of the openings of, of young writers. Um, they're telling instead of showing. Writing's been my passion, even through the ups and downs. But even when, even when a writer is really specific, as, as this first one is, um, I bought an informal bag made out of canvas with black trim, a laid-back purse. We still, we don't even know enough about the woman who bought this purse to care that red makes her happy, or this purse makes her happy. So I've just offered you three, three examples of, of beginnings by writers who, who's, who are doing this thing that Philip Lopate's talking about. They, they seem to, to think that you're, you're pre-sold. You, you already care about them. I made a hundred. So there must be a gazillion back of the room. Yeah. No, no problem. Um, the first task, you know, for, to fixing this, it seems to me, is, is to get some distance from yourself. Imagine what you look like from the ceiling of the room, or from the front of the room, or the back of the room, or how you come across at a Merrill House gathering, or what the rest of the people in your workshop see when they look at you. Distance, by the way, and detachment in personal writing are, not, are, are, are often a matter of time. The longer you've had to, to think about events and put them into perspective, often the, the better you're able to write about them. But it's not always the case. I've, I've seen plenty of 19-year-olds, some of them in this room, um, who, who are able to write really eloquently and, and wisely about things that happened to them just a few weeks ago. You have to give the reader real information. You don't have to put your resume in the opening paragraph, of course. But you do have to find a way to signal some things pretty quickly. Um, among those things you might signal are ethnicity, gender, age, religion, class, politics, geography, quirks. I should at least be able to finish an opening paragraph and think this is the kind of person who I should be able to finish that sentence. Um, gonna, and you know what, I'm mindful of the time, but I think I'm actually doing okay. So just so that you don't think I'm always mean to my students, here's, here's an opening by another one from that same batch. And she doesn't, she doesn't tell you much, Sarah, but it's, um, maybe you tell me what she tells you. In my family, the middle name is brandished like a weapon. We are not allowed cute or charming names, only dignified and important ones, as if the increase in syllables would bring us greater success. The names are all passed down, recycled between generations, the evidence some of us might say, of good breeding. Just name, name one or two things she's told you in that paragraph that matter. Anything. 
Yeah. They care about class. Yeah, she, her family cares about class. Yeah. It's, it's enough to, to, you know, it's enough to go on. It's a, it's a sort of slender thing, but, but, but I'll, I'll read the next paragraph after that one anyway. So, so you have to introduce yourself. Secondly, you have to practice negative capability. That's, you know, Keats's notion from that letter to his brothers. When a man is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after facts and reason. You want a strong sense of self, it seems to me, as a human being and, and as a writer. Who doesn't? But that sense of self needs to be pliable enough not to foreclose other possibilities for itself. One of my pet theories, meaning that it probably will not hold up to any kind of serious scrutiny, <laughs> is that nonfiction writers have unusually porous boundaries, that we are, usual, we are unusually able to melt into other people, to be changed by the group that we're in or the surroundings. Um, the nonfiction writer's persona is less costume than a, than a kind of camouflage that allows them to see without being seen. Here's an extreme and sort of self-aware statement of the essayist condition by Emily Fox Gordon from an essay in the, the American Scholar. Quote, I am a passive woman. I am a gormless woman. I love gormless, meaning a, a woman with no core. My life has been characterized by an extreme and pervasive failure of agency. When I look back at my 54 years, I'm appalled at the proportion of my time I've passed lying on couches, smoking, dreaming, sometimes reading. Three, avoid a foolish, cons a foolish consistency, Emersonian term. The artful persona is a chameleon. Its possibilities, though not limitless, are multitudinous. It modulates itself early and often without ever undermining its essential unity. It draws on a range of diction as well as rhetorical modes. It can be irreverent as well as serious. It can be vulgar as well as formal. It can whisper intimately in the reader's ear. It can pound the podium. It delights above all in catching the reader off balance. Sometimes it shows up dressed inappropriately for the occasion. But whatever else it does, it does not, the nonfiction persona does not stay the same from page to page or from year to year. Okay. There's Bruce. <laughs> Bruce, Bruce like completely blew my theory on Monday. For years and years and years, he's worn a black shirt to give his craft talk and a white button-down shirt to give his reading. And he wore a white button-down to give his craft talk. But again, fiction writers, this is the, you know, the proof here is that, that fiction writers and poets have rich inner lives because <laughs> they don't express it in their outer life. No. <laughs> Uh, here's just a bit from the middle of an Annie Dillard essay that I like a lot, titled The Stunt Pilot. And it, it, if you don't know it, the essay, you have to just take my word for it that Dillard's persona up to this point has been one of clinical detachment. She's like, she's, she's, beauty is her query here, but she's, she's pursuing it like a scientist in a lab coat with electrodes. Um, and she's not, despite the title, really interested in the pilot. She's interested in what the pilot can do with the plane. The pilot is a man named Dave Rahm, and he's 40 years old at this writing. He's now dead. At the height of his powers, and he's just been doing some barrel rolls with Annie Dillard in the plane. She says this, I looked at the back of his head. I could see the serious line of his cheek and jaw. He was in shirt sleeves tanned, strong-wristed. I could not imagine loving him under any circumstances. 
I can't even analyze that line. I, I, actually, maybe I can. I hate to because I'm afraid of killing it really dead. But she puts us into a lean. Dave Rahm is, is smart, he's handsome, he's incredibly accomplished, he's in love with danger. She has to be falling in love with him. We're falling in love with him. And then she says, I could not imagine loving him under any circumstances. It's, a, it's one of the only moments when she reveals anything. As, as a matter of fact, I think it's the only moment in the essay when she reveals anything about her, her personal feelings. So it com comes as a real shock. Four, be, credibil be credible. Credibility is really tricky, and I'm not going to spend very much time on it. Nonfiction writers spend a lot of time wringing their hands over it. It is possible, as any of you who are parents and to have told your children about Santa Claus, to tell the truth, um, to, to tell a lie persuasively. Um, it is also possible to tell the truth in a way that strains credulity. How do you make yourself seem credible, regardless of whether the material is, is true or not? We're going to assume it is. For one thing, tell me something I didn't already know. If you teach me something new, then I will probably think, I will, I'll put you up on a pedestal, and I'll probably think you'll, you'll, you'll tell me the truth about anything. Um, here's a bit. I hope Lester doesn't mind. Lester, are you here? Can I quote just a tiny, where are you? Just a tiny bit. Here's Lester Hendricks in a really, really wonderful bit from his, his lovely essays about growing up in central New York. There are seven species of highly synchronized cicadas. Four, found mostly in the south, have 13-year cycles, and three, including a species found in central New York, have 17-year cycles. I knew cicadas had cycles. I had no idea that some cicadas had 13-year cycles, and some had 17-year cycles. I, I found that fascinating. I, I will go anywhere that Lester wants to take me <laughs> now. If the story that you have to tell, and to, just to name two others from my workshop, um, you know, if, if it's about teen domestic violence, or if it's about Navy SEALs in Vietnam, strains credulity in places, or pushes toward melodrama, then my advice, which may not hold in every situation, is to tell that story in language that is as plain as a plank. Avoid phrases like, trust me, and I know it may seem unbelievable, but because these are red flags to the reader. In the end, it seems to me, though, that credibility comes down to a kind of organic wholeness of being that is really hard to put your finger on in the same way it's hard to put your finger on why, why you trust one person and why you don't trust another person. Are there unreliable narrators in nonfiction? That's a good question, Jennifer. <laughs> the persona in personal writing, it seems to me, here's another one of my theories, always, always, always has to be out in front of the reader. The very definition of an unreliable, uh, unreliable narrator in fiction is, of course, that, that that person is not as aware or as smart as the reader is. The reader knows more than the narrator. So I, I think that's a situation that can't happen in nonfiction. But I'm, I've been casting about for examples, and if anybody has any, I, I'd welcome them. There are certainly nonfiction writers who flirt with this. Um, it's hard not to think that they're really just playing an elaborate game. Paul Theroux's uh, eulogy of Bruce Chatwin is a masterpiece of character assassination. Does anybody know this? He specializes in it. If you've read Servidia's Shadow, you, he's got a book-length character assassination. <laughs> but uh, here's, here's just, that's a fabulous essay. It's one of the best essays I've ever read, but it is mean, 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 mean. When I think of Bruce Chatwin, who was my friend, I'm always reminded of a particular night, a dinner at the Royal Geographical Society, hearing him speak animatedly about various high mountains he had climbed. And that struck me as very odd, because I knew that he had never been much of a mountaineer. That's how it begins. It gets even meaner, actually. It's so mean. <laughs> I wanted to know more about his homosexual life, which was, at, at this time, deeply buried. He died of AIDS, but he died um, claiming to have been ill from a virus that he'd contracted in a, in a jungle. Um, not because I'm 
I know, is it prurient? Is that how you pronounce that word, prurient? Not because I'm prurient, but because if I like someone, I want to know everything. And while Bruce was exasperated by others who kept their secrets, he was secretive himself. He never wrote about his sexuality, and some of us have laid our souls bare. Um, I, I, it's a skillful essay. I'm, I'm not completely sure that Theroux is, is aware in that piece of how much his envy of Chatwin is showing. Another writer who seems to go off, who to have gone off the rails a little bit trying to be playful, who lost control of his persona, is um, John Degatta in The Lifespan of a Fact. And I, I, I say seems because I haven't read the whole thing yet. I'm just going on the basis of reviews. Are there are people in this room who've read this book all the way through. It just came out. Okay. I, you know what? Peter, I know Peter knows more about it too. We, we, it's, a, it's a book that is made up out of Degada's conversation with a, a fact checker who, who found um, errors of fact and really outright lies in nearly every sentence of an essay that he was publishing in The Believer. The Believer, yeah. Um, and Degada prints here, you can see, he, he actually, the book is structured like their, their conversation. Anyway, in both cases you could argue that Theroux and Degada consciously were crafting a nonfiction persona that is not especially likable. That seems like a live possibility to me, but I'm not sure why they do it in the same way that I'm not sure why somebody would go to a party and then be really rude to the host. So, I, don't, I don't know, I'm not sure I didn't know what they're up to. Lauren Slater has a memoir about epilepsy. And when she reveals near the end of this book that she might not actually have epilepsy, that it might be a metaphor for some other undiagnosable malaise, you're not really all that surprised because the title of the memoir is Lying. <laughs> so, you know, she signals right at the very, 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 very beginning that uh, she might be lying in this book. A little footnote on lying. I'm not going to say much about lying. It interests me, but I talk myself into circles really quickly. You can't lie as a nonfiction writer, writer. You can't lie. You can't indulge in deceit or concealment. What's trickier, of course, is the fact that so many people, writers among them, lie to themselves. Here's Tracy Kidder again. Just because they are committing words to paper does not mean that writers stop telling themselves the lies they've invented for getting through the night. If you are lying to yourself, even the least tiny little bit, your readers will know it. They will smell it. This is why we all need early readers, candid readers, who can say, uh, perhaps you could say a little bit more about your mother. If you're telling great big lies to yourself, you do not need readers. You need a therapist. <laughs> Five, avoid self-indulgence. The first time that I got up on stage, I was four years old. I was wearing a purple butterfly costume with sparkly antennae and a purple tutu. I liked the applause so much after my performance that everyone else left the stage and I was still up there bowing. My dance teacher had to come up on stage and pick me up and carry me off so the next group could go on. <laughs> I don't know where it went. Oh well. I think I'm going to make that go away. <laughs> You might say that self-indulgence is my Achilles heel, even now. Writing an essay or memoir is always a self-indulgent act. We self-indulgent people are drawn to this genre for that very reason. But it means that we have to exercise unusual discipline to stifle the inner ham and to subordinate it to the task at hand. You have to keep reminding yourself, I have to keep reminding myself that even though I'm the narrator of the work. The work is not about me. Here's Patricia Hempel again. 
true memoir is written like all literature in, it, in an attempt to find not only a self, but a world. And here's Vivian Gornick again on her own rules for stifling self-indulgence. I am never to tell an anecdote, fashion a description, indulge in a speculation whose point turns on me. I am to use myself only to clarify the argument, develop the analysis, push the story forward. So often this, this really is about winnowing down, going back and taking out a lot of the jokes and the self-referential metaphors. Another way is, is to use irony, wit, self-deprecation to avoid taking yourself too seriously or at least to avoid the appearance of taking yourself too seriously. Bragging in nonfiction is an art form. You do it not by reveling in your accomplishments, but by being revelatory about your pain and your fear. If you are of a mind to ask Brian Hall after the talk, he can tell you about the one thing that nobody can ever, ever, ever brag about in nonfiction. I'm not giving you any clues. Six, be charming. Charm is a very powerful force in human relations. Every couple of years, I go to a conference just for nonfiction writers, and I am reminded of this. We are about as awkward and graceless a group as you can possibly imagine. It's a convention for wallflowers. It's amazing. <laughs> Probably this is why we are all drawn to the form. We can be uh, charming on the page in a way that we can never be in life. All of literature, of course, is a conversation, strangely intimate. That's Patricia Hample again. Between writers and readers. If you write just because you're in love with the sound of your own voice speaking, then you will never write anything good. And I've, I've offered you a, a couple of examples of charmlessness, which I will not read, but they, they come from um, two 19th century texts. Margaret Fuller writing on her encounter with Thomas Carlyle, who allows no one a chance but bears down all opposition, not only by his wit and onset of words, resistless in their sharpness, as to so many bayonets, typo, but by actual physical superiority, raising his voice and rushing on his opponent with a torrent of sound. It's a wonderful case of form and meaning being intertwined. And also Emerson writing about Coleridge. That the encounter between Emerson and Coleridge happens I think at least two decades before in the, in the 1840s, but it, it, the visit was rather a spectacle than a conversation of no use beyond the satisfaction of my curiosity. He could not bend to a new companion and think with him. That goes back to my, my point about pliability, the, the necessity of being pliable. Um, Here's Patricia Hampel again on, on charm and charmlessness. Charmless, charmlessness is not only a form of aggression, but of dishonesty. A revocation of an essential part of the candor that lies at the heart of respect for others. For in human relations, to dispense with charm is to dispense with the other person. This, this seems incredibly important to me. Also, she says, to speak or to write without charm is to make utterances without reference to a reality outside of oneself. It is an act devoid of the playfulness of art, without the attractive humility of one who knows absolutely that others exist and therefore feels drawn to please them, because to give them an instant of pleasure is to acknowledge their existence. It's a wonderful little treatise on charm in life and writing. Number seven, and this is my last one, don't be too charming. <laughs> this is related to self-indulgence, but it's a little bit different. Self-indulgence is about thinking too much about yourself. Being too charming is about worrying too much about your readers. Um, sometimes in an effort to be charming, we cross the line into, into ingratiatingness. And instead of persona, the trap here is that instead of persona, you end up fashioning a kind of carapace. It serves the purpose of protecting us, protecting us from the readers that we seem to be trying so hard to charm. 
but also preventing us from being seen. It's hard and brittle and breakable. Instead of, a, instead of a genuine essay, a thing that comes from the French word for, for try and attempt, we, we deliver something that looks more like a, a stand-up comedy routine or a set piece. And I've offered you, um, I've offered you a, com a couple of examples, one from a, a, a really terrific essay by Nancy Mayers. I think it's pretty easy to find the rest of the essay if you're interested in it. And if, if you can't find it, I'm happy to copy it for you on not liking sex. And it opens with, with this paragraph that's offset. The other day, sitting in a tweed chair with my knees crossed, drinking a cup of coffee and smoking a cigarette, I looked straight at my therapist and said, I don't like sex. In the next paragraph, she explains that that opened an essay she'd written a couple of years earlier, and then she disavows it. She says it was a brittle, glittery piece, a kind of spun confection of the verbal play I'd like to engage in at cocktail parties, but can muster only at a solitary desk with a legal size yellow pad in front of me. It was, in fact, as you can see if you read it straight through, cocktail party chatter. It was true, she says. It was tr I didn't tell any lies. But, but she had made something, made a vehicle, made an instrument for herself that didn't allow her to say any of the difficult or even really interesting things that she has to say. About, about sexuality. Mostly this is, a, this is a really, this is an essay as much about language, more about language than it is about sexuality, but um, it's really a nice example of a writer making an essay out of the crafting, the abandoning of an old carapace, of an old shell, and the, the adopting of a, of a new and, and better persona. And I, th I thought I would end um, um, and, and with Carol McAfee's gen generous, generous consent, that I'm, we, we might end by talking a little bit about this memoir of hers that she's just brought back for the third year to this conference. And, and I, I don't think that I will hurt Carol's feelings, because I've said this to her many times, and she, she knows it, that the, she had done this Nancy Mayer's thing, and the first year that she came to the conference, she had this, she, she'll say more about the early version of this draft, but it, it, it the problem with that draft, which was a, it was it was a funny memoir about breast cancer, was that um, it, it couldn't say anything difficult. It couldn't it couldn't move. It had no it had no flexibility to it. And and so uh, I, I think I'm going to try not to say too many things about Carol's essay, that, that Carol's memoir that she could say herself. But I think that to me the achievement of, of this year over the last two years is that. Carol has found a persona that, that, that then shows her what her material is, and it's, it's richer and more complicated, though often very funny. She's one of the funniest writers you'll ever read. It's very funny, but it's not trapped in the sort of sitcom laugh track like the, the first version was. I, I, I typed up a little bit from her, the draft that she brought four years. It's actually been four years, hasn't it? Three drafts, four years, with one year in between, I think. I typed a little bit from her, her very first draft, but she brought with her today uh, two versions of a passage, and I thought she might read them for us and talk a little bit about what that was like to, to, to discover the persona um, in, in, over the course of four years. And then, oh my gosh, we have time for questions. Whatever you like. I think Jennifer is being very generous. Um, my first draft of memoir, my memoir, Perfect, it, um, now I characterize it as I was like a Las Vegas lounge lizard. Uh, I was like bada bing, bada bang. You know, I just had kind of one, you know, kind of funny thing because I wanted to take you through my breast cancer without you feeling any pain. I think I was trying to, both with myself and with you, trying to carry us through, and I was too worried and I wasn't really revealing myself. So um, you, you might have the handout of what something I thought we could compare. Um, uh, the first paragraph that I'll read is, is it's from the first draft, uh, and I'm describing my psychiatrist. And, it, um, you know, hopefully it's funny, 
But my whole book kind of stayed on that, uh, what Jennifer called that kind of brittle, uh, you know, I didn't give myself any room to move from being this Las Vegas lounge lizard. So I'll read that, and then I'd like to read the part that I've added in a subsequent draft that kind of goes deeper and, and brings you closer. Um, so it starts out, though she looms large in my psyche, Dr. Khan is tiny. Her bones are delicate, her ankles, her wrist bones. The only thing big about her is her hair, a generous mop of gray curls. She's very smart and a little textbooky. She's taught me some new words like optimal and vicissitudes and reproach moi. I've taught her some new phrases as well like go to hell and you don't understand the first thing about me and you suck. I think it's a pretty balanced relationship. And through really Jennifer's help and kind of really working with the manuscript, I realized that I was pushing the reader away with my humor, actually. Um, and it was a defense move. And so um, what I tried to do, as I, I still kind of am a jokey person, so I kind of let you in backstage and let you know that I joke around as um, I'm a daughter of an alcoholic parent, and that's kind of the way I got myself through things. So by kind of bringing you backstage, you're in on the joke with me, and then I can go deeper with you. Um, so from the, my next draft um, is the, the more deeper level. I'm only half teasing here. What I'm trying to say is this. I speak too colloquially. Dr. Khan speaks too formally. Somewhere in between the way she talks and the way I talk would be just about right. Her way is a little show-offy, and my way is a little false. I pretend to be self-deprecating to assure you I don't think too highly of myself when what I really want is your applause. So, yeah, don't do that. <laughs>